Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Saints Home. Oh, we have mics. <laughs> Welcome to Saints Home Church of God in Christ. Uh, today is Youth Day. Woohoo! So today we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to move in a little different direction today. We're going to be talking about um, fear, anxiety, and depression, and what that looks like through the scope of different um, generations and what it looks like through different uh, genders. What does that look like? Um, different uh, expectations or what have you. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father God, we thank you and we praise you, dear Lord, for allowing us the gift of life this morning. And we do not take that gift for granted, oh God. We thank you and praise you for having the opportunity to still serve you in spite of, oh God. God, we know that you're the God that sits high and looks low and you meet us in the valley and you meet us in, in the high places. You come right where we are and meet our needs, oh God. Lord, today we ask that you just let this word and these, this information that goes out penetrate the hearts of your people, oh God. And Lord, continue to be the God that, that heals us, the God that comforts us, and the God that meets the needs. Lord, we praise you, and we give you thanks, and we give you glory, and we give you honor, we give you our praises, we give you our, our hand claps, we give you our hallelujahs, oh God. You're so worthy, God, you're so worthy. And we're so grateful to serve a mighty and wonderful God such as you. Who are we that you are so mindful of us, oh God? We may never know, oh God. But we thank you for being so mindful of us. Lord, we give your name the praises, the glory, and the honor. Amen. amen. And amen. Do you, for a chance, have a scripture, your favorite one? <laughs> uh, let's see. I think one of my favorite scriptures, uh, maybe, let this mind be in you, which is Come also on. in amen. Christ yes. Jesus. So, uh, may the Lord have a blessing to the readers and doers of his word. Readers and doers of his holy word. And um, our special guest today is Minister Aaron Perkins, who is joining us today. My name is Samantha. I am the youth leader here at Saints Home Church of God in Christ. And uh, again, thank you for joining in with us today. I am extremely nervous. You can't see, but my hands are shaking and trembling. But you know, to God be the glory. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it for uh, the glory to God. So, Minister Aaron is going to take us in with a little quick praise and worship, and we're going to jump right into our discussion for today. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's see, I, I, I want to sing something that's on my heart. Um, sing, I love you, Jesus. Yes. I worship at the door. Just want to tell you that I love you more than anything. Yes. I love Jesus. Yes. I worship at the door. You just want to tell you that I love you. Jesus, 
For, so, for some of us, that could be our pastor. For some of us, that could be our big sister, our big brother. For others of us, it could be our parents. And that is, it, it's all of those people for me. So right. that's, that's kind of my source, you know, when I'm feeling fearful. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, like the other night when you called because of the earthquake, I picked the phone laughing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but everybody in my house is over 40. So it shook. We roll right back over and lay back down, right? Because if you're around my age, if we're older, we were alive for the big earthquakes, you know? So we've experienced a couple of them, you know? We, we sit there, we want to pay attention, and that's what we do in life. This is how I handled the earthquake the other night. First, it was a big boom, and then it shook, and I stood still, like, how long is it going to shake? That's it? All right, nothing's going to happen. Because you know, it's the time, the length right. of the shaking that right. does the damage, right? right? So because, oh, somebody write that down, <laughs> pin that. That's good. That's the best. That's, that's good. the best. <laughs> that was the best. That's thing. good. The Lord just deposited that in my spirit because that's how we do it. Absolutely. Do. But uh, I, and I think it's the length of the shaking. That's, but because of my experience, right? Being a few years older than you, because of my experience in that moment. I knew that if it didn't last longer than a certain period of time, I was going to be okay. Right. So I didn't have fear. So that's crazy because that, that means that for a lot of a lot that's going on, a lot that we deal with in that space, we find ourselves. I love that you said it's the length of the shaking that, yeah. that, that depended on how you were going to react. Right. And sometimes it's the length of our suffering. It's the Correct. length of what we're going through Correct. that determines. How we're going to respond, right. and if it's getting to be too long, then we begin to get fearful, right? right? And that's when that scripture comes in: we be made do it for a night, but joy comes in the morning, because we're so concerned about the nighttime. When sometimes it's already morning, but the, everything around us looks like night, right? right? And so we got to we got to get out of that that mindset and really depend and trust God. That, uh, uh, regardless of the length of what's going regardless on. Regardless of what the length of what's going on. Right. And but see, to the other side of that is, yes, it's a good thing because I've had those life experiences to where I wasn't so fearful in that moment. But what if it had gone beyond that time, right? right? right. So sometimes it's um, it's the ignorance. It's sometimes ego. We get a little puffed up. I've been here before. Right. Sometimes we're too ignorant to fear. Mm. <laughs> well, come right. on. Sometimes we're too ignorant to fear. You know, and um, we see that now. We people, see that right now. People who have decided in their mind, and I was one of those people. Who yes, you were. <laughs> At the start, you know, I was one of those people who was like, "Yeah, okay, it's a pandemic, whatever." But it's true. We because we're so it, we're so prideful and we're so dependent upon our own knowledge that we cannot accept. Sometimes other things that are realities because we we, we set up shop and fantasy outlet right. and we determine what's going to happen in our world when in, re in reality it's not up to us. It's really th there is a real situation happening here, right? right? And you have to acknowledge that. So speak same the same thing of fear. We spoke a lot about us relying on pastors or elders, um, parents, uh, parental figures, teachers, or what have you. What would you say to the person um, in your age group that may not have those people in their lives and they find themselves in a fearful situation? Where you where you lacking, wherever you're lacking, I would say, uh, let God fill the void, right? What if you don't know God? Or what if your relationship with God is, is, right. is a fairy tale right. or right. you I, never experienced it? I I I I can I can I can I can see that. I would say that you have to develop some. some we naturally, for for the most part, develop some sense of community. Correct. There is a a few people who can live on this earth all by themselves. You being one. <laughs> but most people develop a community. For those who do not, though, you know, I think that you would have a better uh, sense of direction for those who do not develop that sense of community. But for those who do, use, I want to challenge my generation, use your community. I mean, I was just checking in with the Facebook 
And I'm, well, I, you know, I saw some folks in my community jump on, my grandmother, you know, my parents and things of that sort. Those are pieces of my community, but everybody doesn't have those figures in their lives, like you said. So sometimes it, it may be your peer. It might be your brother. It might be the, the person that might be going through the same thing that you're going through. Develop a sense of community, and then that will help you with whatever you're afraid of. Right. Because at the end of the day, if you if you know that you're not going through whatever you're going through by yourself, and I think if you know that, then you have you, you, it, it puts you at ease a little bit, right? Right. Because that's why the the children of Israel were so comfortable in slavery. Right. Because although they were going through turmoil and slavery, they were comfortable because they were around people experiencing right. the same thing, right? Right. So. Know that you're not alone, and that will put you at ease, right? right. <laughs> well, I would say I would say the same for my age group. Um, I think, though, for um, my age group and, and those that are before me, we were raised by what we have coined as the silent generation, and it was uh, fake it until you make it. Uh, it was, it was, you know, we don't talk about those things. You are right. Get past right. it. Yeah. So a lot of us now, that's why a lot of us are seeking therapy and uh, <laughs> currently struggling. Currently struggling with things like feelings <laughs> and addressing feelings. Um, because there were so many things um, that were passed down because they didn't know. Those who raised just didn't know, so they did the best they could with what they had, right? So uh, for me, uh, fear comes in a different way. Because it's like my grandmother didn't teach me that. Mm. You know, my dad didn't know that. Right. Like, what what do I do with that? How do I how do right. I figure that out? And then um, uh, generationally speaking, it's by this time I should have this right. together because my 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 uh, elders they had this together. Yeah. So that fear sets yeah. in. Right? Yeah. And it gets a little paralyzing where I'm going to talk about um, a different direction where people get to what you said, how, the, how they got comfortable in their fear because there are people around them. Sometimes you get comfortable in your fear because going beyond that mm -hmm. is scary. Right. Because you don't know how to get, you get complacent, yeah. right? It's, it's that, that saying that um, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Right. Because I know how to suffer. I know how to suffer when this first started happening with the um, coronavirus. I talked to my uncle in uh, in Texas, and he said, "Girl, we're gonna be all right. We know what it is to struggle. We know what it is not to have. We know what it is." And we laughed at that. Right. We 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 chuckled, had a little bit chuckle behind it. But there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people where there's um, resources. Speaking for my age, there's resources, and I hear so much. Well. This person had bad credit, that person had bad credit, so I'm just gonna have bad credit. <laughs> you know, this is what I know. I'm proud of my community, I'm a proud of my environment. This is all I know, so this is all I'll ever be. So I think um, fear sometimes look does it outright show in our generation by the words, by the saying, I'm fearful or I'm frightful, but it shows in the unwillingness right. to move past it or discover other ways right. to um, develop or to get better. Absolutely, and, I, I, and to take the question that you posed and to kind of reverse um, the responsibility of that question, I would charge the, the church. I would charge- that's what we're supposed to be. <laughs> that's what we're supposed right. to be. So although, you know, it's like, what would you say to the person that's going through I, I want to say for a second, what would I say to the church? Right. You know, that, that is, is lacking in that position because your responsibility is to meet those who can't meet you, right? right. Your right. responsibility as a church is Absolutely. to meet them exactly where they are. Whether without they're on, judgment. Without judgment. Whether they're on the street, whether they're on the corner, because we place a lot of power in everything else except ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard, especially for my generation, because we, we take the social structure of that we live in and we place power in that and it has authority over us that it should not have. I think in our conversation the other day, and I mentioned it because I wrote it, and I said, um, you know, people find themselves depressed and fearful 
because they were accepted by a world that shouldn't have the power to reject wow. them. Right. right? So the reason why we find ourselves depressed and fearful is because we've given a world a power that they should not have. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of rejection. We're so we're so scared of being rejected. We're so we're so scared of not being accepted. When the reality is the world doesn't have a choice but to accept you because it was designed and created for us. Right. In fact, we have dominion over the world. Right. So we can't give the world dominion over us. Right. right? You get to influence the world and not allow the world to influence you. But I would say in that same, in that same token, it's healthy that your generation recognizes that. Yes. Because my generation, we're in the, we're the pre-internet. <laughs> right? Right, right, the pre -internet. early internet, right. right. Like, I have this beautiful piece of equipment right here where I can type everything in. I had about three notebooks that I was delivering with it today because we were taught, write it down, practice right. your penmanship. So I think uh, another source of fear for my generation and my pastor, my pastor Paul Grimes is here with us today. Y'all can't see him, but he's off camera. Uh, but he mentioned earlier he was watching uh, a service because you know this during the internet days, these cyber worship he gets a church hop. <laughs> <laughs> but we was watching a service earlier, and he mentioned this one elder. These people have never had Facebook before. They've never right. had. The, they never wanted to, they never had the desire to, they never had the need to. So I think a lot of us are in this place where, what do we do? Yeah. You know, how, how, because we've been taught, again, people don't, they didn't know, right. we've been taught, internet is bad, stay away from it, you know, holiness right. is right. But <laughs> I feel like there's a shift because what does holiness look like now? So I think a lot of older people, fear may be setting into them because they were taught to abolish this, yeah. right? Yeah. So fear for them may look like, am I serving God because I now have a Facebook page? Yeah. Like, how else am I supposed to get to Bible study because the government says I can't? Right. So I think there's so much fear yeah. um, that we don't address. And you know, let's make adults pray for them because right. how do they admit that it's that they're fearful? And because they've been taught not to. Absolutely. Right? And I, especially for your generation. And for your for for your age group, I've acknowledged your age group and up, they find themselves scared of everything technical. They're like, Ooh, who's watching me? You know, the government they can pass on me on the internet, you know, acting paranoid. I don't care who keeps tabs on my iPad. If, if you scared of what somebody's seeing on your technology, then you have to have whatever you have on there that you, you try to hide. You got to take Everybody's taping up their cameras. And they shouldn't be able to see me. Who cares if they see you? At the end of the day, like you said, these are outlets which allow us to spread the gospel right. at a rapid rate, right. right? And so that's how I do technology. I never give a thing more power than I give God, but I do acknowledge that this is a resource to the source. Right. Literally, a resource to spread the source. Write that down to the <laughs> Write that down. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a resource to spread the source. If I never get on live, if I never get on Facebook, if I never share a scripture, share God's word, share a song on my heart, at the end of the day, then how will some of those folks that don't know God know that we exist? Right. Right? Because... If you if you look, I mean, we're looking at this community right now. Then you got folks who don't know God and don't care to know God walking all up and down the street. Right. But now they cannot avoid us because we have infiltrated, we bombarded. bombarded all of these all all social media platforms. <laughs> so you know, you got West End, you got all these churches that are popping up on everybody's feed, and they're like, "I'm trying to get to uh, such and such BET or whatever I'm trying to get to." And we are on there. And so, you know, TV don't have to be the only source of right. gospel, right? right? They don't have to be the only source. The Word Network don't have to be the only source. Right. You are a source in, in your own right. You don't have to wait till you get a TV show. You don't have to wait till you get right. a space. Start that YouTube channel. Do right. what you need to do to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. My sister Tiffany said something um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were talking of pretty much the same topic of the conversation we're having now, and she was saying how um, she's 
watch where other churches would go live and they would only have like one or two uh, viewers. And here it is four or five weeks later, they have 100, 200 right. viewers, right. right? So these small churches that they feel otherwise they don't have an impact within the community, they have now reached a larger scope and cast a wider net. So I believe, you know, when this is lifted and we're able to come back into the doors, I think fear of being judged, fear of not looking the part, fear of not being accepted by the church people will somehow fall off and people will now come to the doors yeah. afterwards because they're going to want to get that community, that human connection that yeah. everybody's been good, couldn't get, excuse me, um, online, but the online was an avenue to open the door right. and to get back in. So we want to close this piece off because we have a couple more pieces to go and we don't want to keep... Um, Everybody here. I'm so sorry if there are questions being posed. I don't have. Um, we can see it though. If you have questions, okay. post your questions. If you have if something you want to say, I'm watching you right up in here. So okay. I can see. And my phone is streaming on Instagram, but I don't have it right here. So unfortunately, Instagram, if you have a question, just drop it in the comments and we'll circle back to you later. We'll do better next time, I promise. <laughs> but I do want to close out fear with, uh, with a couple of scriptures. Deuteronomy 31, 8, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Isaiah 43, 1, don't fear, for I have redeemed you. Yeah. I have called you by my name. You are mine. Uh, I want to, just real quick, real quick, uh, uh, Elder Donnie Nelson, he preached um, a few months back in one of our district settings, who's your people? Yeah. yeah. Right? If you're from the country, they ask you who's your people. Who's your people? Right. Or or like in Louisiana, my area is who, who you for? <laughs> who, who you for? Who you with? And right. then no who you for. And if I say, I'm saying Jackson Star. Oh, you're saying Jackson Star. Like your name, your your family name carries a lot of weight. So yes. for this scripture, when I read this one, I've read it a million times. But when it says, don't fear if I have redeemed you, so that means to gain or regain, that means I can gain possession of you, right? And he says, I called you by my name, you are mine. Who's your people? God, I'm his people. Right. So that means, you know, I shouldn't have the spirit of fear because I can call on the name of the Lord. I am he's mine, I am his, and because this world is his, and whatever thereof is his. Right. I have access to right. what's out there. I right. just have to jump over the hurdle of my own fear and go out and grab it. Uh, first John uh, 4, 18. Perfect love casts out all fear. And there's another love that's more perfect than the love of God. And Psalm um, 18 and 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. So those are some things to kind of uh, ponder yeah. in the scriptures. So now we're going to jump to anxiety. Ooh. <laughs> <sighs> anxiety. anxiety. <laughs> that word right there. So anxiety is defined. Um, the noun definition is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with a uns an uncertain outcome. COVID-19. Right. Especially for y'all extroverts. When we gonna get out the house? Right, that's I for me. I want go somewhere. I have come to that that you share. Listen, <laughs> I have to get out of the house. Right. I have to go somewhere. Okay. And you know, the Lord uh, checked me in my spirit because I was low-key judging. I'm like, the government is telling us to sit in the house and not people. Let me kick my feet up and right. relax and not people, right? But there are people that just as much anxiety as I have around people, there are people that have that much anxiety right. without being around right. people. Right. Right. They, right. they need that, right? So uh, I'm sorry for all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you no, it. no, but really anxiety is something that definitely plays yeah. uh, my, my age group. My, my, my uh, peers are plagued by this a sense of anxiety. And, and oftentimes the church and old, old saints, they just throw scripture at you, right? Like, be anxious for nothing. Like, we got that. We understand the word. Wow. But how do I be anxious, you know, for nothing? And the reality is, it's, it's really hard to be in that predicament. Now, 
living a saved life in general is it's, it's hard, but it becomes easier with the Holy Spirit. But understanding that, like even on a college campus, when I was in, at Morehouse, there was so much anxiety and such a heavy spirit of anxiety because everybody is concerned about their next step, right? Like they're all worried about what's happening next or are they enough to be where they are, right? And so we have to to come back anxiety with affirmation, right? right? You come back anxiety with affirmation. You affirm yourself. You decide and you determine that you are enough for where you are. Right, right. Well, I think uh, that's the same for my generation, but with work. Right. Right. With, with a job and bills. With a job <laughs> and bills. And, you know, the coronavirus happens and we're like, okay, cool, what else? Right. And then it says, okay, you're going to be, uh, most companies have emergency pay. So you're going to be laid off. But what's pay? Cool. Right. That's a blessing. I can, I don't have to people. I don't have to get up early. I don't have to fight traffic. I don't have to go to work. And you're still gonna pay me word, cool, word. right? Because you're in the, we're in the same situation as everybody else, but we have that security net. We have that security blanket. We're still gonna get paid. Those are gonna get paid. I'm good. We right. don't have to necessarily worry about the next step. But then four weeks pass, the company's like, "Hey, yo, so we paid you, but we don't that emergency pay is run out." Uh, I know 6.6 .6 million people have applied for unemployment, but you're about to be in that number because now we can no longer pay. Now anxiety comes in, right? But it looks different because what makes you anxious in your generation, um, I know a lot of us um, over the years will say, that's nothing. Don't right. worry about it. Right. That's nothing to be anxious about. That's nothing to be fearful about. Don't let that hold you back because we've been through. Right. But here it is now, our jobs and are, are in danger. A lot of us don't know if we have jobs to come back to. There are a lot of companies that have dissolved, a lot of entrepreneurs who took that leap. They got over their fear, they got over the anxiety of opening their own businesses. They took that leap and here they are, unable right. to get paid now, right? Yeah. So I can only imagine the anxiety that they're experiencing. But I think, um, circling back to what we said in fear, we have to uh, gain a sense of community. Yeah. And I think also with anxiety, we have to um, not be so anxious about what people will think and open our mouths and say something. Right. You know, and I think that's a huge, for my age, that's a huge source of anxiety because we're used to suffering in silence. A lot of, a lot of what we were experiencing was unknown to us. We didn't have a name for it. You know, but we knew that if we said something, we would be met with a get over it. Right. And it was, it was caused, it, it, uh, I know a lot of people may have turned to drinking, a lot of people may have turned yeah. to drugs, because what was going on in here and what was going on in here, but, yeah. that, who do we talk to about it? Because right? there's a sense of, of again, I know it's like the fear, and the fear of the unknown, but, but it's a sense of like, okay, I cannot get over this thing. And I mean, I mentioned the first part of Philippians 4 and mm -hmm. 6. But I do want to mention the whole scripture, right? Because I don't want you, I don't want you to get half of what yeah. the Bible says, right? right? So it says the ages are nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Right? Then verse seven that nobody talks about says, and in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. That means my heart and mind is covered by the blood, yeah. right? And so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what it is that I'm, I'm feeling because I won't say it doesn't matter. I want to be careful about my words. Not that it doesn't matter, but what it is that you're feeling, it's okay because it's covered in the blood, right? right? It's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he will add peace to that. Right. He will cause peace to be still because he's a peacemaker, right? And so you have to find yourself depending this, you know, anxiety is such a spiritual thing more than it is a natural thing. I know sometimes the church can over spiritualize things, but the reality is when you're dealing with anxiety, that very much so is a spiritual thing because you're now allowing the natural things right. to manipulate what right. you believe. Right. And that, that, that doesn't match up, right? And that, that goes back to what you were saying. 
right here and here ain't, ain't seeing one and one, right. you know? So you have to make an effort to depend on God, especially when you can't depend on nothing else. Right. Psychiatry defines anxiety as a nervous disorder characterized by excessive uneasiness um, and apprehension, typically with compulsive behavior or panic attacks. Um, signs and symptoms of um, this form of anxiety is um, feeling weak in your body, yeah. feeling pain, uh, being tired, restless or tense, uh, hyperventilating, seemingly without cause, um, unable to concentrate, trouble sleep, sleeping, experiencing in insomnia. Um, it can be caused by trauma, it can be caused by health conditions, it can be caused by medications, it can be caused by substance abuse. So with that area of anxiety, how is your generation dealing with that or experiencing that? So, you know, because I, I have my moments where I, I, I'm like, ooh, this is a bit much for me, you know. Let's take a second, let me regroup. My generation tends to lash out, right? My generation is like, no. You know, we tend to be rebellious to a certain degree when it comes to being anxious because we're impulsive at times, right? So we make a decision. And we're like, that's it, we stick it to it, and then we go on our tangent. You can't tell me nothing about that, you know what I mean? And so as, as a 20 year old, you're like, okay, and I have an old soul, so we, I'm not always high five <laughs> with my generation, but I'm like, Lord have mercy, I have a twin sister. My twin sister. Don't tell me. I can tell my, her business <laughs> like that. But I do have a twin sister. And, but I'm saying the point of having a twin sister. I think it's because it's such a great balance for me. Like where I lack or where I don't understand something, my sister exhibits that understanding. So I, I'm blessed to be able to talk and, and kind of get where she's coming from at the same time as she can get where I'm coming from. But that we we just deal with it in a different way. Like we tend to like you talked about substance abuse and for I think for older people they more have a physical thing, like their body gets tired, like you were saying, but I think for us, we like, pass me a joint, yeah. you know, yeah. pass me an alcohol beverage, because yeah. I need to calm down, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're dependent on that, because that those are substances that have the ability to alter your mind, they have the ability to alter uh, your mind stability. Right. So people are just like, you know, if I can chill, pass me a joint, if I can... You know, if I can't if I can't figure this out, it's cool as long as I'm smoking three months a day. You know right, what I mean? Right. And so I, I, I don't think that that's the healthiest way to deal with that. And if that's I could, reality. but it's reality. It is reality, but it's not the healthiest way to deal with it. I would I would say that when you are at that level, when you're at that space where you feel like you gotta depend on other substances to um, to kind of put you at ease. You have to seek counsel. Right. I think you need to go right. see a, a psychiatrist. Right. And I think the church sometimes is like, no, come on up to the altar. We're going to pray. Yes, we're going to pray, but you need to go to the doctor. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to make sure that when you get up tomorrow and you. I want to make, sure, okay. make sure you get up tomorrow. Yeah. I want to yeah. make sure you see it Absolutely. tomorrow. Right? You got you to gotta do that. And that's why I think pastors, I, ch I challenge pastors, I challenge preachers. Study psychology. You know, even if you don't go to school for it, study psychology. Yeah. Understand how the mind of the human beings work on all different spectrums and all right. different levels. Right. I agree. I agree. Uh, generalized anxiety, um, that's just the larger scope of it, is what we've been speaking on. Um, there's social anxiety. Right. That's <laughs> me. That's me. I just might have to take a Xanax if my mom would be a lot of people. I just, I just might have to. Um, but we can't uh, judge people. Absolutely. Just like, I, again, I apologize, extroverts, because I judged y'all. But I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give myself an allowance here because all of my extrovert friends are always. It's not that serious. It's not that deep. You have to get out the house. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And now that you've been uh, forced into my world, now it's like, ha, you've been judging me all this time. But um, sometimes, and I know it may, 
a lot of people who don't, who aren't close, close to me, don't think that I have anxiety or that I'm an introvert because I can mimic very well. But um, I do have social anxiety. You know, I could be in a place, give you about a good five, ten minutes, and now I'm ready to go because it's, it's too much, it's a bit overwhelming. Um, there, there is separation anxiety, mostly found in, um, in children, but also in people that have experienced some traumas in their life. Um, they, they've experienced some abandonment um, and as a child, which uh, followed them into adulthood or early adulthood, where they experience separation anxiety. Um, selective mutism is also one um, that's more like when I'm, and I am not a, a professional, so those that are out there watching, don't judge. Uh, but if you are a professional, uh, Dr. Maisha Driver, uh, you can go ahead and drop some, <laughs> drop, drop, some drop, drop, drop your contacts, because okay. <laughs> we need your help. We need you to make sure you know. <laughs> But, um, so like the mutism, that's, um, you know, when, especially in children, when they can be chatty Cathy at home, or, you know, around their friends, but then you put them up in front of the church to say their Easter speech and they're just, mm. just staring at the face. And because we don't know, we're not aware, we tag them as disobedient, mm. we tag them as unruly, we yell, open your mouth, speak up, can't hear you, when all, it took everything they had to even come up yeah. Yeah. to the front. So I think, I think this conversation is super long overdue in this platform because we're just unaware right. of a lot of things and how anxiety looks different in different people. I know some children, if they say often that their stomach hurts, that's a sign right. of anxiety. It is. You know? And not only that, it also, I, I, anxiety is really the basis and foundation of the term church hurt, right? Yeah. When folks are dealing with church hurt and they're like, ooh, I, 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 don't, I can't go back to that church because they, they messed up. This is why we have to be careful as churches because as we that's why we have to stop operating as individuals and begin to operate as a unit. Because now you don't even know that you're 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 implementing so much hurt in someone right. that when they leave they bring that same attitude into the next person's service, right? right. They might leave across the street and come over to the same home. And they are hurt from across the street, but because they they're here, you know, they're gonna put off that hurt onto right. this ministry. Right. And so, if we were thinking about the next person, don't always think about don't don't, don't be so possessive with your members, right? Like I, I tell a lot of people, don't. <laughs> some of us like, oh, you go to this church, you uh, you try to steal my members, and I was like. Why I can't let somebody would tell another pastor this? Because you don't have any members, right? You are a servant. Yeah. You are a vessel. Yeah. The responsibility of a leader and a pastor is not, it's not to decide that you're going to be possessive over these people's lives, Ooh. but that you're going to be progressive, right. right? That you're going to help progress their life to where they need to be, to where they're going to go. You're like a cheerleader right. for God saying, hey, I got the word, I'm going to impart this in you, right. and I'm going to help shepherd you on behalf of God. You're just a, a, a lead sheep. Right. You're not right. a shepherd, you're right. a lead sheep on. on behalf of the shepherd, right. which is God, right. you know? So we have to make sure as a church that we don't leave kids feeling that way. I mean, it hurts my heart to see young people just just disgusted at a church that they never even had an opportunity to be in or to participate right. in. Like I went to school, there's so many people who don't like God, but never, never was in church. Oh, I, I can't do that church stuff. But it's because we have to we have decided to project an image right. that is not true. Right. And so now you got folks anxious about coming to church, and how can you how can you advance the kingdom if people if people don't trust you? Right. You know what right. I mean? And I think again, it just comes from a place of what's that 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 hand down way of thinking, that yeah. hand down way of teaching. Sometimes we have to get to the point, to the place, and say. You know what? Maybe it, you know we say it worked for my grandmother. It worked for me. Right. Maybe not. 
Maybe not. Maybe not. No. Because you know we have to we have to take the scales off of our own eyes, right. and we have to look at the reality of it. Where now that we have this knowledge, and now that we are aware that these type of anxieties exist, right? It's not apples to apples. We can't compare right. this one to that no, one. Right. You know, it's not. And I say it all the time. Even if we compare apples to apples, that's like comparing a Washington to a Granny Smith. The only thing it has in common is that it's an apple. Right. Right. But they look different. They taste different. And that's like us. Mm. That's like right. people. The only thing we have in common is that we're humans, right. and we right. may have some similar characteristics, right? Uh, and a lot of that comes from mimic behavior. Mimic behavior. Because there's nothing new under the sun, right. but but do understand that if you want to be, if you want to experience life at its fullest, right. then you want to take the time out to be careful right. about how you about the decisions that you make. Like I tell people in my generation all the time, I don't have to do certain things because I've seen how it's worked for somebody else. In other words, that's the same. Uh, uh, same analogy people use about the stove, it's hot, right. and such and such. Like, my grand, the things that my grandmother went through, the things that my mother went through, the things that my father may have went through, the things that people have gone through in my life, thank God that they went through it because they right. went through it for me. Right. So I don't ever have to do it. I don't right. ever have to experience it. I don't ever have to find myself in that predicament because those people they did that so that they they could teach me something. Right. So don't be afraid of being taught, right? Don't don't be anxious about being taught. Uh, that's something that comes with learning. It takes time, and I'm still taking that time because <laughs> sometimes I'm like, I don't want, I don't, I don't need you to tell me, you know, what your life experience is. I'm good. But I'm also but, <laughs> I've also seen you um, experience things right. where, um, like when we had our first Saturday Sam. Yeah. Ooh. You're not, you're not, I'm so used to dysfunction because that's just, that's just what happens, right? Oh that's just what happens. You're used to a certain level of excellence, I right? Am. So that disappointment that you had that day, right. it took a minute for you. Yeah, I to mean, get, and, but to do, get you see how, do you see how that can in, negatively impact yeah. Yeah. The, the move of God? Because I, because I allowed somebody else right. who had nothing to do with what we were doing anyways to impact the way that I felt because I have never ever been in that predicament right. but because I was um, I had to come to the realization that this is happening to me right now <laughs> you know? and, it, and you and you live and I didn't live right? so it okay. didn't tarnish your name it, it didn't reflect on it if anything we had an amazing we time had amazing we had amazing time yeah. In God, but that's what I think we can learn from right. anxiety, and what we can learn from disappointments mm -hmm. is if we it, it is. I know it's easier said than done, but I live with it, so I can I can speak to it. Right. If we power through, yeah, but power through with community, power through in right. my generation, it's okay to open your mouth and say, "I'm suffering from anxiety. I'm, I'm anxious. Yeah. I am going through this." It's okay, I'm, I'm not a man, but men, it's okay to say right. I'm struggling in this area. I'm worried about this. And, and I, women don't say, you a man, you got it. Right. You know, we have to tear down. Right. We have to, we have to really shift the paradigm and tear down those narratives because it's damaging. It's very to, damaging. It's damaging to, to and it's, it's, as a man, you naturally, you know, we're responsible. When we're disappointed, if we're upset about something, our natural instinct is to shift our our thinking from uh, trying to to welcome somebody to be a little more defensive, to try to respond to that thing that's caused us anxiety, to try to respond to that thing that has disappointed us, right? Because even that night, like I was ready to be a uh, man of God the next day. But you know, you have to make the decision uh, that you're going to take the high road. I know that uh, first lady Michelle Obama used to say, when they go low, you go high. You know, the good thing about being saved is that you never have to worry about being low, right? Because even though when you feel low, you're actually high. Like, you actually on this on this different level because, because that's who God is, right? right? And if you are, if God is a great God, and you are an offspring of Him, 
then you're an offspring of greatness, right? He's before you. <laughs> right, and he's before you. Who can be against you? So you have to understand that uh, if somebody does you wrong or if somebody causes you anxiety, you, a lot of times people say that you have to go back to that thing to heal from it. But I really believe that you don't have to, you don't have to respond to that thing, right? You have to address it. You have to address it. Yeah. You just have to address it. You don't have to respond. You don't have to cuss it out. You Because that's what my generation do. We believe in cussing you out, meet me on the corner because I'm going to fight you. Right? But you don't have to do that. It's going to be okay. Right. Because at the end of the fight, you never heal from it. You right. just made things worse. Right. You know? I mean, you know, the Bible speaks of Daniel saying that, that he was troubled in his spirit about the visions, yeah. you know, that he was seeing. And, and David, it says David cried out to God, you know, because of what he was going through. So it's it's okay because I'm going to close up um, anxiety because you have to go to depression. No, thank you. My pastor is so good. You pass me water. That's you not water. Mighty God. Come on. Pastor Bruce. Like you, you were going on a roll with, with Daniel. And then not only that, I just started thinking about Joseph. Come on. Right? And his brothers. Come right? On. He, although they threw him in a pit, got rid of him. Come they on. never healed from that. Come on. And it, it bothered them all the way up until they saw him again. And, and uh, granted, Joseph would never know. But at the end of the day, he understood that he said, "You all did all this trouble for uh, for the younger brother. They they didn't do all this trouble coming to look for me. That's because uh, Joseph never healed from it. Right. So on both ends of the spectrum, right. there are things and, and and things that we go through that we have to be willing to heal from. Healing is not always physical. Right. There's some spiritual things so you got to heal healing. from. Some mental things." You got to heal from it. So we we can address all that in prayer. But sometimes you just got to talk to somebody. No, you got to you gotta deal with somebody. Yes. I, I mean, the yes. youth leaders in this season, for some apparent reason, have been extremely silent. Mm -hmm. This is not the only time that the pastor gets to be Come on live. Find your time, Monday through Friday, yes. to talk to these young people. Because yes. we are going crazy. Yes. You know? That's why I'm so grateful to have our um, regional president and my jurisdictional president. I need to claim her twice. Uh, <laughs> president Evie Tinsley. What you guys see on Facebook, I can assure you that she's doing it offline. Right. I get text messages. If I don't respond to the text message, I'm getting a phone call. I'm getting a Marco Polo. She's trying to find a way to reach out to us to ensure that, um, that we're okay. Right. So I think we should um, adopt that. Um, she's casting an amazing shadow. As a leader, you know, what kind of shadow are the rest of us casting oh as leaders? Absolutely, because you, know? you know we all talk about when we get back into the church, we don't bug, we don't right. shout. We get back. But what about our youth <laughs> that are struggling right, right. now, and we're not going to see? Who knows if we ever get back into the church? What all about right. what about our youth that are struggling in homes? We're safer at home. What about the people that are not safe at home? My and God. this is the time to make your house church. Yeah. Right, and so and I love how God orchestrates stuff yeah. because in this situation we have no choice but to be at home. Right, people are uncomfortable at home because they were leaving their home to come to church to it's deal safe. with what's at, home. what's at home. So now God is saying, "Hey, no, hello, you're at home. Deal with that thing at home. Heal from that thing at home. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. So now you're being forced to be in your house." Right. To serve the Lord. What will you do in your house? How can you take over that atmosphere? How can you make sure that your house is covered by the blood of the Lamb? If you, I mean, if you got to get up and have six days of prayer, I live my life like church. If you know me, anybody that knows yes, me does. knows that I live my life like church. Yes. I get up and we have a program every day. Every day of my life is a program. And so live your life like like you claim that you live your life in church, you know? Let that be reflective in your home. Don't neglect your home in this season. And I'll say, um, before we close it out, and I'll say um, for those of, and I know we've spoken heavily about um, how to live life as a Christian and in church um, as it relates to these topics, um, but that's because we're church kids. <laughs> that's, just, right. that's just what we know. We're just saying. But there, but there are people that may be watching that are not church kids. Um, or may have been a church kid and experienced church hurt, and yeah. they're no longer yeah. um, a part of the, not the body, the raw part of the body, but they're not a part of the building or the congregation. Um, these things still apply. I still right. say, reach out. 
I still say, try to address what's going on in your home. I still say, um, dig down to the root cause yeah. of your anxiety. And we're sorry. Dig, dig, sorry. Look, we, we, the church. we we're sorry. sorry. I mean, we say that we can talk about the church all day, yeah. but we are sorry that the church left you hanging. We're sorry that, but guess what? Never give the church that much power. And if, for those of you all who may be watching, for those of you all who may have had a situation with the church, when you've experienced church hurt, don't give the church that much power. Yeah. I want you to understand, you serve God. You don't serve a building. You don't serve a pastor. You serve God. And he sits on high. And so you don't want to give the church that much power that you allow them to hurt you. Mm. And, you, you, you know, but in reality, you, we're human. So we get hurt. We get offended. We get bothered. I'm, I'm apologizing on behalf of those ministries. And then just like the saying that says hurt people, hurt, hurt people. people. And that's so there happens. are a lot of leaders in a place of leadership who are hurt. Who are hurt. Hurting others. Hurting <laughs> others. Because they themselves have never healed right. from the hurt they experienced. Yeah. They, right. they haven't healed from the abuse they suffered as children. They right. Haven't, they haven't healed from watching right. their, their moms being abused. You and know? then they go, and then they're kind of dogmatic. Absolutely. But again, this is not excusing anybody, but it's what they know. Right. When I was a kid, they didn't let us wear pants. When I was a kid, they didn't let us come, you know, chew gum in church or whatever it may be. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you chew gum or you sip Pepsi in church. As long as you are in church, then I'm all right with that. Come as you are. Yes, if you, you are. all you got is, two, is some jeans and a, and a tennis shoes, I'll meet you next Sunday because you're going to have church. And, and come as you are also relates to your spirit or whatever Absolutely. life or makeup you have. I can't go to church because I'm on drugs. I can't right. go to church because I'm an alcoholic. I can't go to church because my come spirit on. is troubled. But the come as you are relates to the poor in spirit. Yeah. If you are struggling, that's where you need to be. Right. And right now, while the church doors are not open, I know everybody has a church friend. Come on. I know a lot of people. That <laughs> I, if I'm your church friend, Reach out to me. I got you. Right. Because it's, it's time for that. Be right? that. And I want to tell that to look, young preachers, right? Young preachers that, that love God and that, you know, you tend to be that church friend for right. people. Don't shy away from being there for those people in this season. You know, I hate when people say, oh, I can't be around them. I just, you guys just gave me a whole answer to what I called them about that too long ago. I can't be around them because they, they, they're, they're like this and they're like that. And it's going to change and shift. How I am and how people think about but me. But what if it changes shifts then with you being around? Right. And not only that, look at Jesus. Come on. Jesus walked with the drunk, the, the, the poor, the people who were sick, the people who had diseases. Jesus was not afraid of your condition right. because he knew that he had the ability to shift that. Be that confident in yourself, man of God. Be that confident in right. yourself, woman of God, to be around where you want to be around and shift that atmosphere until right. they change. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Pick my thumb down. But that's, that's so true. A lot of what um, is said is true. But again, if you are feeling any type of way, talk to, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Talk, that is literally the first step. Yeah. Talk to somebody. I am watching so many people now that we're home. Most people that are usually not on social media yeah. have been on social media right. because they're home. I'm watching so many of my friends just sad and depressed and full of anguish. Yeah. And I don't think it's the circumstance. I think the circumstance is forcing us to address head on what we had experienced or what is is pretty much lying beneath, right? Right. So I say to you, man of God, woman of God, um, be the church now. Be the church. Let's reach out to our friends. If we see somebody struggling, let's call. Shoot them a text. Yeah, yeah. And this is not, I know y'all miss the pulpit. <laughs> I know y'all miss the sound of the Leslie. I know y'all miss it. But when you're reaching out to minister, it's not your time to preach. Yeah. It's not your time to preach. It's not your time to, to put your hand behind your head and it's not. It's not the time for that. 
what it's time for is to say, I see you struggling. I see you going through some things. How can I help? Come on. Yeah. How can I be yeah. a friend first? Right. How can I be a friend first? I know uh, my pastor says all the time because we do ministry out in the neighborhood right. over here. And again, what it looks like to the other churches, it may not look like this, the same way for St. Tom. But, you know, if you if all you have is the ability to pass out candidates, that's what your neighborhood calls for, fine. But for this neighborhood, we know a lot of people don't even have stoves right. to cook their food. So we cook food. What you're going to eat in your house, we cook it for these people. Right. And my pastor sits down and dines with them. That's right. You know, because he says all the time, how can someone hear me if they're hungry? Mm, that's good. That's good. Too. How can you come and talk about God who's a provider and God who can give you anything and everything and God who loves you and cares for you right. when your children haven't had I anything know. to eat? Right? So I think that's the space where we, we are in now where, yes, we have to be safer at home. Yes, it's saying that we can't be out in the communities. But I think this is it's a pivotal time for the church. Right. Not denomination. Right. It's the pivotal time for the church Should. to go back to being the church. Right. To go back to the dropping off food yeah. to the seniors. Yeah. You know, people who people who are fostering children. Mm. You know, I don't know what the government assistance is looking like right now. Oh and they may not be used to having all these children in the homes at the same time. So they probably have run out of food. Right. And because if they're fostering children, they're probably a little older, that means they're probably my generation or older. So that means circling back to fear, they are probably not saying anything. Yeah. Like, right? And you gotta be honest about, you know, especially being African American people. Right. You know, or people who are a part of, you know, that, that community of, of, of people of color. You have to acknowledge that the reality of the situation is the government is set up to help the bare minimum. Yeah. We're going to give you the bare minimum. We're going to make sure that your bills are paid because we're taking that money back, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So we're going to make sure your bills are paid because you're paying that. So that, that, but that's it. We're not making sure food is on your table. We're not going to make sure because they're not going to extend themselves that far. Why? Right. It's not their responsibility. That's where the church comes in, right? When Dr. King was marching, when all of these influential people were marching, uh, I think about one of my friends uh, who I got a chance to, to spend time with who just passed away, Joseph Lowry. When he was when he was back in that time, and even today, he used to spend that time with people. He used to take that time, just like your pastor, at the table, talking to people, making sure that they understood that God is real right. and that everything that this church is providing to you is an extension of what God is giving them to do for right. you. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Everybody wants the authority, but they don't want the responsibility. Come on. And so as a leader, you have the authority to be responsible right. for the people that That's you serve. Your That's your charge. That's your charge. Is to be responsible. Right. So you don't want the responsibility. Please don't pray for the uh, the authority. Don't pray for that. Because God will he'll give you, he'll elevate you, but at the end of the day, you have to do the work. You have to do the work. We have too many people elevated and in authority in authoritative positions doing absolutely nothing. And because of that, people are suffering. People are suffering. And you'll be held accountable. Yes. Come on. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with um, a couple of scriptures for anxiety and then we're gonna go over into um, dun 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 depression. <laughs> um, Psalm 94, 19. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Yes. Philippians 4, 6, <laughs> 7. Do not be anxious about anything, no, no. but in every situation. That's right. But in every situation, right. every single situation, yes. regardless, right. every, everything, every situation, whatever situation is causing you anxiety, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and let the peace of God, which transcends yes. all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. And 2 Thessalonians 3, 16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times right. and in every way. The Lord be with you all. That is something up for anxiety.
somebody. Um, I hope what is said is encouraging somebody. Yes. I hope somebody is encouraged. I hope somebody feels a little bit, not better, but I hope somebody feels a little more um, open. Right. To, and aware mm -hmm. of what it is yes. that you're feeling. And know that you're not alone. You know, I know a lot of us in leadership or a lot of us that go to church, we look good and we're, and that's another thing my generation we were taught by our elders. We were taught to be polished. We were taught to be polished. We were taught to not look like what you're going through. We were taught whatever happens in this house stays in this in house. house. Yes. That's what, that's, yes. What, that's what we were taught. And I get it, but some of that was a little unhealthy because we went through life not feeling like it was okay to talk about Right. What we're going through, and we inherited some bad habits and we passed down mm -hmm. some bad habits. But you know, thank God for His grace, allowed us to live this long to the technology era, where we, knowledge is at our fingertips. You know, and I'm grateful for my pastor allowing us to do this because a lot of people don't know the resources that exist. And going back to the church, we should be knowledgeable in the bare minimum to offer direction yes. to a lot of people on how to get help. So um, depression, this is a very touchy subject with a lot of people because a lot of people, again, suffer in silence and don't want to, not that they don't want to address it or not want to um, admit it, but you don't know. Yeah. You don't know how and you don't feel safe um, addressing it because you don't want to be judged. That's why there, there are so many people in leadership that are killing themselves. Mm. So many pastors, so many missionaries and evangelists that are taking their lives, and I'm sorry if you have children watching, forgive me, um, but because there's the hurt, I, I suffer from depression, and I have people that are close to me that suffer from depression, not this is the circumstance and I am sad. It's in here and here, and it, it, it lives there. With, whether it's the sun is shining, birds chirping, I have money in the bank, but I still feel what I feel. Right. And, and that's okay, because it's, it's the genetic makeup, it's just, it, it's how it happens. Yeah. Um, illnesses, sometimes people get sick, and you know, you've had surgery after surgery after surgery, but that fear stays with you and it kind of paralyzes you. Right. And you know, you, you're fearful and uh, moving forward, or developing, or addressing, you know, what have you. So depression is defined, is there a question? No, you could. Depression is defined as feelings of severe uh, despondency and dejection. Um, and it's usually just an overwhelming feeling of, I'm not good enough. An overwhelming feeling of, uh, maybe there's more. A lot of very successful people yeah. struggle and suffer with depression, what, how, I know it seems like they're all the same, and fear triggers anxiety, anxiety triggers depression, and I know it can also work um, in the okay. other word. So for your generation, um, what struggles do you guys hear, or what struggles do you feel as it relates to depression? So I oftentimes say that depression causes depression, uh -huh. right? The pressure causes depression, right? And if the reality, you know, the, we have to, my generation usually become depressed because of um, a lack of identity, right? Mm -hmm. A lack of not understanding who you are and uh, what you've been called to do or, you know, just in life in general, what direction to go in, who to trust, who to talk to, who to depend on. And so when you don't have the answers to those questions, you your mind starts to, you know, place you in, in this stage, in these stages, literally in these stages that we just discussed, right? You it starts off just as some innocent fear and then it grows to like, wait, I really don't know. Like I, I, I now you're anxious, you know, and then you get to this space where it's like, forget it, just forget life, forget everything. Yeah, you know, and you just throw it out. And you know, I resonate with depression a lot because I know my experience um, being a heavy set, you know, kid a little bit, um, 
I wasn't always big sex, though. I had my skinny days. <laughs> but uh, what I was, what I did get heavy set and experiencing a lot of bullying. Um, I thought I was being bullied because of my weight, but I had been bullied for a long time just simply because I was different. Yeah. And um, that experience was so heavy um, that I just chose like forget it, like. I'm done. And, and I remember just sitting in my room like, this could be it. This could be the end. And I mean, my school had called my mother and made a whole, whole thing out of it. But it was something very personal to me. Right. right. It was a serious thing that I was going through. And I really felt like I would just be better off without you know, being alive. Yeah. But I was still at church, right? Yeah. I was still preaching. I was still teaching. I was still doing everything else I was doing. But I was depressed. Oh and sometimes as leaders, we do that. We, we still be in, we'll, we'll stay in spaces. We'll stay in leadership because we're trying to allow those things to be some sort of, uh, um, some off-putting of how we're really yeah. feeling. Right? It's like, I, I, I obtained a plethora of achievements just because I want those things to define me. I didn't understand what defined me. I didn't know right. who I was. Right. And so because of that, I tried to be, you know, everything in the book. If you know me, you know, okay, Aaron was doing a lot. Yeah. I was. Yeah. I was doing a lot intentionally because I was not okay with being Aaron with no title. I was not okay with being Aaron with no responsibility, with nothing to do, with not being busy. I just could not, I couldn't see myself being that person. Right. And it took time for God to really humble me because some, sometimes, that you, you know, you're depressed because you, you're prideful sometimes and right. you want to be at this level and you're not there. And right. it's okay to not be there. But when you're not okay with not being there, you 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 start to feel depressed. Yeah. It's like, man, I should be here. But no, you shouldn't. You should not be there, you know, at that time. Yeah. To everything there's a season. God yeah. works in, 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 in divine time. So when it is your time, when it is your season, you be ready because God's going and, and God's never gonna place you somewhere you're not prepared for. Right. So I know where I wanted to go, and I know what I wanted to do, but I was not prepared to do that. And so God didn't place me there. And so once I got comfortable with that and knowing that, then I, I got a chance to really understand who I was and why I did what I did. So a lot of people in my generation, we quickly, like depression is our go-to, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we think that depression is suicide. We, we think that that's just the way out. And, and, and sometimes we, we, we're quick to give up in my generation. Right. We don't believe in fake until you make it. We don't believe in trying to stick around and, and, and put on a face. We believe, all right, this ain't working, peace. Bye. Yeah. Like, bye, I'm done. You know? And so we have to begin to really take that seriously as a church and as a community for real. You know? And I think um, my ministry is being uh, transparent. And I've had some people tell me, Samantha, if, you, if you're saved and you're the youth leader and you're this and you're that, you shouldn't be so open about depression. You shouldn't be so open about your battles with suicide. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. And I'm like, well, why? Because they need to see that this smile that everybody compliments is masking depression, right? Somebody needs to see that as much as I hear from God and as much as God deposits in me about other people so I can intercede on their behalf, I'm struggling just as much, yeah. right? And people need to see that God, A, is with us all and God, A, A, can use us all. Right. He can use us all. And we had our Bible band uh, talk a couple weeks ago uh, your ministry in pain. Like, nobody likes to feel pain. Yeah. Nobody likes to feel pain. But pain teaches us a lesson. Mm -hmm. Pain is one of the biggest teachers. It teaches us not to do that again. It teaches us to be aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I've seen this before. It may not be the same exact thing, but it's like, oh, I've seen this before. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we have a responsibility, not just as a church, but as people, as people, 
to identify what's going on in those that are younger than us. Yeah. Because we've experienced it. I can say, I've seen this before. I've seen this in right. me. And pull them, you know, and have them closer to you. Yeah. I think um, as a culture, not African American, but I think the time that we're in, this culture that we're in, it's me and my four no more. Mm. So if you're not in my immediate circle, you're not my problem. Right. And I think that's also, not to everyone, but I think that's also trickled down to leadership. If it doesn't directly affect me, if it doesn't directly impact me and mine, I'm going to give you a good message on Sunday and we're going to right. limit it there. But I think um, we have to get to a place where, especially my age group, because how you speak, spoke to your age group is like, oh, that's it, done, check it out. That's why my age group is huge. I think the 40 and up, some of the biggest alcoholics. Because if this is happening, I need a drink. If I'm going to face this, I need a drink. If I'm going to go through this, I need a drink first. That's why so many of us um, in this generation, in my generation, a little older, are struggling with um, alcoholism. Yeah. Because it's you go out and you you give people so much of yourself and you give people so much joy. You make so many people happy, but excuse me, there's so much there's chaos, there's war going on inside of you. So when you are not on, right? When you're not um, on stage or on platform, or when you're not when it's not time for show. You take your mask off and right. you're your real self, your real hurt self, and your real sad self. And you don't want people to know that this is your real you for being judged because they think what you say in the pulpit is fake, it's not real, you don't really feel that. And I can see for myself, I feel that. I believe the word of God. I believe God is right, I believe God is loving, I believe God is caring, but I believe also that we're not exempt from the struggles of this world. And if it was so, I think the scripture would have said so. But it says, yea, God, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. It says that we're going to be in some valley experiences. It says right there, I'm going to be in some valley experiences. Right. But it also says he prepared a table for us at the yeah, end. Yeah. So he knows that what you're going through in the valley experience is going to be depleted if you're going to go through some struggles, you're going to be tired, you're going to be weary, but once you make it through to the end, I've prepared a table for you to right. sustain you, to yeah. give you back everything that you've lost, and so that the devil and the enemy and everything that they thought would defeat you can see that you're not defeated. Right, and then not only that, uh, uh, I was going <laughs> not only that, but uh, it, it's it's like, uh, I, I know it's like you were saying that so I'm having, oh, praise the Lord. I know it's like you were saying that, uh, you know, people and other preachers and other leaders that have been suggested to you that it's not, you know, best to put your flawed self in front of people uh, because how can, how can you minister like that? How can they take you seriously? They'll receive you better. My generation will receive you better. When you're authentically your flawed, true self, right. my generation will, will see you better. It's your generation. Better. I don't know what kind of eye God gave y'all, <laughs> but y'all can spot the faith. We can, and we and we real. We real, real about it. You know, and I'm churchy, but at the end of the day, I don't like no foolishness. Right. People that know me know that I don't like foolishness. And I will tell you, you know, I don't like people who profit try, don't profit try. <laughs> don't profit try at all. You need to be, you need to be if God is saying something, then you need to be 100% sure. Because if you're wrong, I'm going to tell you, you know. But at the end of the day, if if we if we took that philosophy, right, if we took that uh, uh, that mindset of not being our flawed self in front of people because of who we are and our position, then at the end of the day, uh, we would not have the, the infallible written word of God. We would not have the Bible. Right? We would not have it because at the end of the day, those are flawed people who wrote those books. Right? Those are flawed people who are experiencing, who are sharing their experiences and their perspectives. Those are flawed people. And if you told them what people are telling you, then how would we be able to understand what God means that right. I know in this season? Right. Right? Like uh, uh, First Lady Clint put it in the, in the Facebook 
several times different people, um, different prophets, well, both that she shared with prophets. Prophet Elijah, Prophet uh, uh, um, Jeremiah, yeah. who's going to weep a prophet, preached yeah. about him last week. People have to understand that the weeping prophet, he was a weeping prophet because he, it was hard. Yeah. It's a burden to yeah. deliver God's word yeah. and the predicament and the circumstance that he was in. He wasn't coming to tell them everything is peaches and cream. Right. He was right. like, this is Judah and yeah. it's going down. It's like, going down. And right. he had to share some of the most heaviest stuff. And so what does that tell us that even through it all, right, even through the midst of it, God is still there and he is with open arms wanting to hold us. And, to, and because we cannot feel that all the time, everybody doesn't have that ability to feel God, quote unquote, hugging us right. like First Lady Quinn, you know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, we have to do that as a church. Yeah. Come here, let me hug you. Yeah. Let me love on you. Let me stop being. You have to take all the all the take all the little take stuff all off. The gravy off. Yeah. Like, sometimes we we just I mean you know especially us we are a colorful people. Yes. We are a jovial people. Yes. And I know us the joy that we have is because we come from a background right. where so much pain, right? Right. And you know in those times of of slavery and circumstances like that, there was no choice but to get around each other and Absolutely. sing and, 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 you know, and do those things. So I understand that's being carried on and that's why you know we are who we are. Yes. But at the same time, we have to not be so dependent upon those things to think that makes us effective. Right. You know, the, the, the squalling doesn't make you effective, yeah. but it's the words of the song that you're singing yeah. that's penetrating somebody's heart that's making you effective. Right, and then the things that, they, that people do, I think about the prodigal son, right? Yeah. Like, who had, who, who made up in his mind, he has a real, real, real prideful mindset yeah. at, the, at the beginning of that parable, right? But at the end of it all, that experience who, humbled him. Yeah, that experience humbled him, and it, it, it speaks to what Jesus was trying to get across to us, right? Like, you're going to go through some stuff, and then some of you all are going to be depressed because you're prideful, and some of y'all are going to be depressed because you really are dealing with some stuff. Right. Some of y'all are depressed because you're jealous. Let's talk about the brother of the prodigal right. son, right? right? So yeah. everybody has different experiences, and that's why I love how Jesus taught. He taught in parables, yeah. because... Everybody has different experiences, right. but you can find yourself in you all of them. You can find yourself in all, all of it. And, and you can find yourself in different roles. Yes, in different, in different roles in different in the same life. And, but you also have to understand that you will always find God in it. You yeah. always find Him as a representation of a Father. That's why we call Him God the Father. Because He exhibits, and he, I really want to say God the Father and Mother, because He exhibits what we say a father and mother is supposed to exhibit. Right. The nurturing the component nurturing at the same at the, the same token and discipline discipline and providing, right? That's what God does for us yeah. on every level, right? He makes sure that He is there for you in the midst of your circumstance and situation. So what will you do with that? Because if you're gonna be if you want to, if you want to go through what you're going through, if you're going to go through what you're going through, whether you choose it or not, because the reality is, some things we go through we do not choose, right? Which is why the church can't judge you. The church can't judge right. where you are because you didn't get to choose where you are, right. right? The reality is, God has sometimes set you in circumstances to prepare you for your assignment. Sometimes He sets you in circumstances to prepare you for what your testimony. And we overcome by the words of our testimony. If right. you never go through that, how will Sister Susie get through it? Right. If you never go through that, how will Brother Moses get through it? So you have to make sure that you are in a place of, as a church, we have to make sure that we are in a place of welcoming whatever stage you are in right. and then helping you through that process. And we, again, if you're coming, we both, both sides have to be okay. Right. If you're coming into the church or to the church, you have to be okay with being open and being transparent right. about what you're going through. Yes. And those of us that are already in the church meeting those people, we have to be okay with being right. open yes. and being transparent about our past. Yes. Because again, start going back to that amazing Bible study lesson, it was ministry, it's been stuck with me since, ministry is defined as something that you're equipped to do your vocation. 
location is, is described as um, suitable. Yes. So your mini your pain makes you suitable for your ministry. Right. If I, as much as I struggle with, I do question the why me. Why did I have to have depression? Right. Is it because my mother had depression? Do I struggle with suicide because my mother killed herself? Right. Like why I have those questions, right? Right. Right. But why does God use me the way He does? Why Why is it that when I'm at my lowest mentally, when I'm struggling the most? He deposits vivid detail of somebody else in their life, and I'm able to minister. Is it because that person is in extreme pain, and I'm yeah. experiencing that same pain, and have experienced wow. that same pain? I kid you not, um, when I was in my early 20s, my, um, it's hard to be 20 to 20 years ago. I keep feeling like 20, <laughs> which is like last year. Right. <laughs> but, um, I was in my room at my grandmother's house, and I would like to what you said from the school. I was like, this is it. Today, I'm moving. Because I had many attempts. Right. Obviously, none of them were successful. Right, right, right. But Lord, this God. one, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> thing, period. This, this is it, right? right? And what I love about God is he keeps trying you. Mm -hmm. Like, Y'all don't know, but when we had landlines back in the day, you called somebody, you really wanted to get in touch with them, and their line was busy, you kept calling, you kept calling, you kept calling, you kept calling. If you called so many times, and that line was being busy, it was not indicative of that person, something's wrong. So you get up and you go. You go to them, you get up and you go to their house, knock on the door, peek through the window, what's going on? That day, um, when I was ready to just go, um, God did that. I was in such pain and such turmoil in my mind that even though he was trying to get to me spiritually, yeah. the line was busy because it was occupied. He couldn't get to me. But he came to me. Right. When I tell you I thought I was crazy, I was sitting in that room, and I heard him say, Samantha, look up the meaning of your name. So much to where I jumped and looked around. Mm. Who's in here with me? My, I knew it wasn't my grandmother because I heard this stupidly man's voice. My father was gone at the time, and she wasn't coming up those stairs, so I knew I was up there by myself. So I'm like, this is, I'm really nuts. This is really, really right. happening. Like, I'm, I hear, I, I don't know how to describe it because I hear the voice of the Lord often, but that day I heard him like he was next to me to where. I was having a conversation. I didn't see anything. I'm not about to be all spiritually deep and say I saw something, a, a light sitting next to me. I didn't see anything. But I turned and had conversation oh and said, look up the meaning of your name. I'm like, I know my name. My dad named me Samantha. You know, I was having that conversation. But when I looked up my name and it said, uh, listener, and then uh, my middle name um, is uh, consecrated to God and told by God. It has double meaning. And he said that day, if you choose to live for me, I'm going to send people in just as much pain as you have been in, mm -hmm. and you're going to help them. Right. So in that place, I was hurting so bad to where, and I'm a nerd, you know me, I'm a nurturer by nature, I'm going to feed you, I'm going to make you good. I didn't want anybody to ever experience what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if I could help pull somebody out of that, oh, yes, God, use me. Right. What I didn't know was that the pain wouldn't stop there. Right. That pain was going to continue going. But what I understand now is that it makes me suitable mm -hmm. for my ministry. Yeah. It yeah. makes me suitable to minister to others that are struggling and need to hear real life testimony of how I went through and how I currently go through and how he yet sustains me and God will sustain you too. So I think harder for me, not me personally, but like our generation is we, we were told not to talk. Yeah. about these things. So I think I have a responsibility as a leader in the church, a responsibility as a Christian, and also a responsibility because God didn't have to save my life that mm. day. Right. And he saved my life to help save somebody else's yeah. life. Yeah. So how That's dare it. how dare I yeah. how dare I sit down on on, you know, you have a question? Because yeah, I think no problem. <laughs> No, we don't have we don't have, we don't have a question. But no, I was I was agreeing with what you were saying, and I I was saying that um, you know I just think back to my my time on college campus, which 
all everything that's going on on the college campus, right? right? Um, but you just never know how God will use you, how much of a light that you are, right? I'm dealing with, I, I dealt with depression, and now here I am on campus, and there, depression is a heavy spirit here, right? right? And so, like, I was at I was at Spelman College one time, and as someone called me, the, the security at Morehouse College called me, and it was like, there's a kid in the bell tower. And they're saying that they don't want to talk to nobody but you. When my, you know, and I call her Etsy, the, the security guard that, that called me. And I said, what? And so I, I go all the way to the bell tower, and the kid's up there, and he comes down. I'm like, come down, let's, you know, let's talk. And he begins to tell me his story and how frustrated he was about life and how frustrated he was with the church. And it's crazy because some of the things that he was dealing with, I had dealt with, right? right? I had the same things that he was saying, the same things that he was dealing with and going through. I had dealt with that. And so God, in, in that moment, allowed the, for the opportunity to minister, to say, hey, we're right where you are. Let me, let me, let me help you. Let's do this together. Let's depend on God. Let's pray. Let's move into a different level and a different season of our lives. And I think on the phone, you and I talked about oftentimes in depression, it's because we're trying so hard to fit in the social construct, right, right of right. life, right? right? That's what came, that's what I wrote. We don't this. fit this. We don't fit this. We don't fit that. And so I wrote, I wrote, I said, if God is the head of my life, when you as a church, when you as my community, when you as my brother, you as my family, place me in a social construct, you're placing a limit on a limitless God. Come on. You're placing Come on. limits on Him, on Come what on. He can do in me, yeah. on what He can do through me, on yeah. what He can do for me. So don't, don't place our young people in a social construct. Don't place people of, in your generation in the 30s or in their, in their teens in a social yeah. construct. This is not the time to be concerned with society yes. because society has constructed itself. Yes. But community and church, that was constructed by God. Right. Be concerned about God's construction, right? And so I'd rather you place me in a God construct than you place me in a social construct. Because a social construct will have you thinking that if you're not married by 40, something's wrong with you. Right. If, if you don't have any babies by 40, something's wrong with you. Uh, for for men, if you don't make X amount of figures, right. something's wrong with you. If you ain't sleeping with everybody, right. you're not If you're not wrong. both sides, positive and negative, yes. right? We, we throw these stigmas and we expect people to adhere to it. I mean, I remember people telling me, why don't you go out, why don't you this, why don't you this, why don't you that? You're weird. Right. Why am I weird? Because I don't, you know. But I, I think uh, to what you said, we have to adopt our own yes. idea, ideas and identity of ourselves. And be open if we, to and, and to, my, my therapist told me that I can limit the amount of panic attacks I have if I stop giving myself unnecessary timeline. Now, that's not to say don't give yourself goals, because I think goals are healthy, yeah. right? I think goals are healthy, and I think goals give you um, an accountability and responsibility to yourself, right? But if you don't make a goal at that set time, it is okay. Right. It is okay. The world will not rotate off its axis. Okay. You will not fall through the Earth's crust. You will be totally fine with that. Right, and, 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 and definitely understanding that at the end of the day, we, we're we going to be there for you, right? And, and you got to be there for those who you're surrounded around. You know, I, I, I deal with, especially to that young man that's maybe watching or that will watch. It is okay to be a virgin, right? I've been a virgin for 20 years successfully, okay? Yeah. And proud to be, and sometimes as a young man, you're in a situation where the ch you know it, it's not always the church that can be because they love that, but it's your friends yeah. in church sometimes that'll be like, bro, you ain't slipped up yet. It's those people in the community that would take your decision to be a virgin and twist it to 
make it mean homosexuality, to make it mean that you love the same sex because you ain't trying to smash some woman. I want you to understand yeah. that as a young man dedicated to God, it is okay to be a virgin. It doesn't mean that you are not, Amen. you know, it doesn't mean that you like men, it doesn't mean that you are we asexual. Have to, we have to pour into our young men yes. like that more often. We got because we, we, we cover our young ladies. Yes. We cover our young ladies. Yes, but our well, young we don't, men. We don't teach our young men that your body is just as sacred. It's just as sacred. It's just as sacred. And you have to have a mindset. Uh, uh, that's why I encourage elders in the church. You know, when I when I told when I decided that I wanted to uh, uh, be a virgin until I got married, I communicated that. I remember distinctively one of the elders in the church tell me it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? And so. I want, you know, now I can tell them it's not impossible to please God, right? It's not impossible to be in that predicament because as long as you keep working, as long as you keep striving, as long as you do your very best, God will do the rest. I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's not easy. But you have to give it your all, for real. Give it you your have all. to work for it. You got to work for it. You have to work and for it. And watch God bless you because you of work it, for it, right? He will bless you. So, <laughs> the scripture um, for depression, I, I, a lot of what we had before can go and coincide with, with what we um, with this topic. But this scripture, Proverbs twelve twenty five, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. So we we have a responsibility to not just sit back and watch our peers and our friends struggle. Yeah. We have a responsibility to um, send a word, send a text, send a, I'm notorious for sending a, just checking on you, text, I'm notorious for it. I'll send a heart, whatever. Um, those things may very well stop that person in that moment from hurting themselves or from thinking um, that it's all over and all is lost. Um, I hope what we've said today has been encouraging to somebody. I hope, I really hope somebody is encouraged by this. Um, some actions to help with anxiety and depression. Um, we are what we eat. We eat trash food, we feel like trash. Um, stop, I'm saying, uh, I know um, economically for processed foods, it fits a lot of our budgets, but um, you can substitute beef for chicken. Yeah. You know, you can go to McDonald's and you can choose apples instead of fries. You know, just you have to shift your mind, shift your way of thinking. Um, you have you have to help you help yourself. Yeah. Um, I know for um, omega three fatty acids, they're good for um, healthy brain function. So foods um, that have that have that in it. Um, what's the stuff that we tease Will about with? Uh, Thanksgiving with turkey. No, when he falls asleep after, after Will eats the turkey and he falls asleep, he said that's the oh, triplicide. Tri tri <laughs> that actually has relaxing agents in it. It's found in turkey and I don't know what other food it's found in, but um, consuming that helps. Um, fruits, yeah. fruits, uh, vegetables, um, incorporate it into your diet. Um, yeah. I know, I know me, I will sit in my room in the dark all the time. <laughs> I never turn the light on unless I need to. It could be 12 o'clock noon and it looks like it's 12 midnight in my room and I have to tell myself sometimes to come out, go get you some sunlight, yeah. um, open your curtains, um, light a candle, light, light a candle, get you some smell goods, um, do things like that. Go for a walk, get your juices flowing. Um, be around somebody. I know right now you can't be around anybody, but God knows that there's Zoom, Skype, Microsoft, Meets, FaceTime, uh, Messenger stuff. There's You can visually um, right. look at people um, in those avenues. Just do something different to see different results. And I know it's going to be hard. I know it's challenging because some of us have been so stuck in the place of depression for so long we know how to function there. And fear and anxiety, it riddles us when we try to operate outside of that. But my brother and my sister that are struggling in these areas, know that 
nothing is wrong with you. Know that you are okay. Don't judge yourself. Don't let anybody judge you. Please know that everybody is going through something. We may look like we have it all together, but we don't have it all together. Some of us looking like a million dollars and don't have anything in the bank. But take something from those people because they look like they have it going on. You know what I mean? Make yourself look good. I know I'm the, I probably, this is probably the first time I've gotten dressed since um, <laughs> we've been off work and probably the first time I've combed my hair and a hair wrap since March 16. But I honestly say I do feel a little better today. I did my eyebrows, you know. Yeah. Put a little eyebrow on, you know. <laughs> put a little something in my curls, they popping a little bit. Right. You know, I put an outfit on and I feel a little bit better. So just do something, every, I challenge you to do one thing every day to make yourself feel a little bit better than the day before. If there's a, a goal of weight loss, just every day take one step closer to make yourself feel a little bit better than before. And if you don't feel good, I don't care if I know you or not, you call me, you text me, you inbox me through Messenger, Say I need to talk. I need a friend. I need. To, I need somebody to just listen. You do that, and 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 I got you. Um, let's exercise being helpers one to another. And I know we've said it before, but we are overcome by the words of our testimony. Right. So if this has been your testimony, if you have struggled with uh, fear, if you have struggled with anxiety, if you struggled with or are struggling with depression, um, don't hold that. Help somebody with it. If you if like what they say, if you see something, say something. You don't have to always wait for someone to come to you. You can go to them and say, you know what? And please don't do it publicly. Don't do it to be seen by men. Your camera doesn't need to come out. Just pull them to the side and say, you know, let's talk. I've noticed some things. You know, help somebody uh, be better in this time. So Aaron has a few things, little slides yes. that we're going to talk about before we uh, close out. Yes, before, before I get to the affirmation and stuff, I didn't want to say that uh, I think that she's given, you've definitely given great advice to us as individuals. And really quickly, I do want to give advice to the church. As a church, if you would, you know, because I'm sure that at some point there's some church leaders that are watching and there's a pastor that may be watching. Um, but don't look down on your saints, right? Don't look Amen. down on your, your congregation. If they have a, a desire to, to be in the choir, then don't make them feel bad about that, right? Don't make them feel bad about one. I remember when I was sharing the folks used to be like, why do you always want to be sitting over there by the preachers? Because I want to be a preacher, you know? <laughs> I want to be a preacher. And so I'm going to sit with the preachers. Thank you, you know what I mean? It's not about, you know, wanting to be uh, in, the, in, in the side of everybody. It's about being around the people that you want to lean and grow from. Yeah. So the singers like to be around singers. Preachers like to be around preachers. And so I encourage the church, don't look down on your young people, don't look down on your church in general, your, your congregation. Uh, spend time um, checking in with your people, right? Yeah. Leaders, youth leaders, uh, whoever you may be, check in with your different auxiliaries. Check in with those different people. Because if you're not checking in, then you get a phone call that such and such and passed away oh, due to killing herself, yeah. and you could have been that one person to prevent that. Check in with your members and your people. Because people always say, oh, I, I didn't know. Right. I had no idea. <laughs> I, I had no idea they felt like, that oh, way. Lord, it's it's always a shock. Yeah. So I'll even uh, piggyback on your challenge. I would challenge them, us as leaders, to create a space. The time is yes. now to create a space. Create that space. Create Zoom space. call it. Do what you need to do. Create a space. And make, make our community resources accessible, mm -hmm. right? As leaders in the church, make those, make those uh, help lines accessible. Make sure you put them in the group chat. Make sure you send them out, sending them out to people, checking in with people because some folks don't know that there are resources that you There are resources that you at your fingertips. Right you now, know? there's a resource. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of them, but um, there's one called Better Help. Better Help, yes. There's one called Better Help. It's like $45 as opposed to a $200 uh, session. It's $45. Uh, you can choose, and if you're struggling with seeking counseling or seeking therapy as it relates to the church or as it relates to God, right. I feel like 
God gives us who we need. He gives us preachers, he gives us teachers, he gives us whatever it is we need. He gave us uh, medical doctors for our physical health. He gave us head doctors for our mental health. Right. <laughs> uh, so if you go to betterhelp.com, you can uh, sign up for it. It's $45. Uh, you can choose, if it asks you about faith, are you a spiritual, spiritual person? Right. You can choose, yes, you can choose to say that you are a Christian. It even asks what, what denomination you serve. Right. Um, it asks you if, if your faith is super important to you and if you want your counselor to have, to be a, a person Absolutely. of faith as well. So there are options out there. And what blew me away with this, because I was trying to do some research, and so I went through it to make sure I can give you guys all the information. Um, it asks if you want prayer to be included in your sessions. So prayer can be included in your sessions Absolutely. with this. Um, I There's so much help so there's much. out there. There's so many um, you can counselors. That, you can, you can, there's so many counselors right. that are willing to freely give of themselves yes. if you need to. We just need to and do the church and build those resources. Yes, that's what health care yeah. is too. A lot of people think about health care as just focusing on yeah. your physical health. Health care can also support you in the areas of your mental health. So if you need to speak to uh, different avenues and parts of your uh, your hospital, your hospital of choice and things of that sort. Your jobs have it as then well. Your jobs have yeah, it as yes. well. You have to be able uh, there are resources that are funded through the government and other, other uh, avenues that give you some quote unquote free help. Yeah. You know, so look into that, look into all of the different um, avenues to support one another. Churches, don't forget about the hungry people that were sitting in your church uh, uh, you know, back before this, right? Because they're so, probably still hungry. They're still hungry. You may want to call them, check yeah. in with them, bring them groceries. You may want to bring them a hot meal because they are still hungry. Don't forget about the circumstances that still exist. People who deal with uh, 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 people who deal with anxiety and these uh, mental health issues and other circumstances, like folks who still stealing. Like I used to, I had this conversation with an officer, people still stealing. You know, you worry about folks standing outside, people still stealing, people still robbing, people still uh, taking from people and things of that sort. So pray for the community, because when everybody is at home, these robbers, that, that don't mean they're not gonna come rob you. Right. Some of them are just robbing you with more force now. So I just witnessed a robbery. So you wanna make sure that you take the opportunity to continue to pray for the needs and the support of the community. With that said, I have some mindset, you know, a mindset uh, shift is what it's called, uh, to help those during this pandemic. So instead of saying, I'm stuck at home, you could say, I get to be safe in my home and spend time with my family, right? Shift your mindset. Instead of saying, I will get sick, you can say, I will self-isolate and wash my hands. This will significant, significantly decrease my chances of getting sick, mm -hmm. right? Instead of saying, I will run out of items at home during this self-isolation, uh, you can say, I have prepared myself for this and I will use my items wisely. I have everything I need for now, right? In other words, please don't overindulge of the people who need toilet paper, God bless you. <laughs> everything, instead of saying everything is shutting down, I'm panicking, say the most important places such as medical centers, pharmacies, yes. grocery stores remain open, right? Focus on those things which are good. Uh, last thing, on shifting our mindset. Instead of saying, there is too much uncertainty uh, right now, you can say, while I can't control the situation around me, I can't control my actions. Doing breath work, calling loved ones, getting enough sleep, and proper nutrition, um, and proper nutrition, prayer, and doing activities I love at home will all help during this time. Those are ways we can shift our, our thinking and perspective. And before um, Aaron closes out with the affirmations, I did uh, want to mention that um, since we are um, in our homes, in our self-quarantine, 
we mentioned that a lot of people may not have a safe home to be in right now. There is a hotline that's still open 24-7 for domestic abuse, domestic abuse or domestic violence. Um, and that number is 1-800-799-7233. 1-800-799-7233. Or um, if you're unable to speak, you can log on to the hotline. It's uh, thehotline.org. Um, or if you are unable to access online because the abuser is present, you can text "love is" to two two five two two. You can text "love is" to two two five two two. And if you have other resources, if you are the medical, um, the mental health profession, or even the medical health profession, and you would love to drop some some resources and some tips in the comments. We would definitely appreciate that. If you would love to sow into this ministry so we can keep doing things like this and we can continue to bless the community because I can't speak for other ministries, but Saints Home hasn't stopped. Um, if you would love to bless this ministry so we can keep going with our ministry, in Facebook, you can go to Use App and click that button. It can take you directly to Givelify, or if you already have Givelify on your phone, you can go to Givelify and you can give to the ministry. Um, you can put it in the youth department envelope, you can put it in the other envelope, it doesn't matter what envelope you put it in, it literally all goes to the same place and that is to help the community. We are helpers one to another and we are servants of this community and we take that role and that responsibility seriously. Aaron is going to close us out with words of affirmation and then he also closes us out in prayer. Absolutely, okay. Um, also, I want, we're going to pray for uh, first responders. I know my godmother, she's a first responder. I'm not sure if pastor may be a first responder. Those who are still working um, and those who have my godmother works for DCFS. People who have to go into houses and check on people who may be getting abused and things of that sort. Definitely want to pray for those people. Um, uh, before we get to prayer, I do want to give you positive affirmations. As believers in this season um, and so say this to yourself remember these words I'm sure first lady Quinn will probably write them down for you as well um, take notes if you guys your pen and paper but you say I am loved by God God has not given me a spirit of fear but a power love and self-control God will never leave me or abandon me God has great plans for my life. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. God listens to me. God had me in mind before I was born. Yes. I have been uniquely designed for a purpose. That's a good one right there. I have been uniquely designed for a purpose. I trust God. Above all that, I trust God. So Father God, we thank you for this time and this opportunity to stand here and to, to be here in this season, to discuss these things, to dialogue about these things, oh God. But let this not just be a dialogue. Let this be a time where we put what we've talked about into action, God. Let this be a time where we reach lives and we reach people all over the community, all over the world as we share the, the gospel, as we spread the gospel and the realization and reality that we are all going through, God. Let us, let us uh, spend this time and this next season of our lives depending and leaning on one another, communicating to one another when we need your support, when we need your love, God. I pray for that person going through depression, going through fear, going through anxiety, going through all of the phases of life that they're dealing with, God. You be their comforter. You be the Holy Spirit that you are. Comfort and guide them, direct them yes. through the next season of their life in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that the God that sits on high and, and, and looks down at us will continue to keep us. He's watching over us so that we know that we are not alone. God is always ever present, God. So thank you for being present as we go through this season of our lives, oh God. Let us depend on your presence. Let us depend on your power. Let us depend on your healing. Let us depend on our salvation. For the blood of Jesus covers it all, oh God. And so we will continue to trust you. We will continue to be uh, to be vigilant and serve you and to seek you. To seek your voice and to hear you, oh God, in this season. God, I pray for first responders. 
I pray for those people who are, are called out to the workforce, who those folks that are going into the houses, people who have to do certain things and to be at certain places in this season, God, you protect them through it all. You cover them through it all, oh God, in the name of Jesus. You meet every need for those of us who are suffering financially, for those of us, those of us who are suffering in certain areas of our lives, God, you meet every need in the name of Jesus. And we will be careful to give you the glory and the praise, not after this, but in this, God. We'll give you the glory and the praise in this thing because we already know that it's already done. We already believe that it's already done. We already see and we stand on your word that it's already done. We're not praying in vain. We're not singing in vain and we're not praising in vain because God said, God said if you ask, then it will be done in his name. In Jesus' name, we decree and declare that it's already done. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank y'all. <laughs>